I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome back to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Uh, please do like, share, subscribe, join and support the platform. Do all that you can to help us continue to grow and put this in your socials if you're able to join us here live. If you're seeing this later, uh, peace and welcome to you as well. Got a very uh, good show coming up. Uh, someone I've I've been uh, looking forward to talking to again for some time, a former colleague of mine, and uh, someone I've actually been interviewing. In fact, I don't know if he'll even remember this, but Dr. Shockley, who I'll give a proper introduction to in a moment, was one of my earliest guests on my first, probably the first ever radio kind of broadcasting program I was involved with over there at, at the, the the Radio CPR Project, Pirate Radio in Northwest Washington, D.C., uh, which at this point feels like an eternity ago. Uh, but he had produced work critical of African images and media, which, of course, piqued my interest as a grad student. I think I was still in grad school at the time. And we linked up then. Then I had the, the pleasure and privilege of being a colleague of his at Morgan State for a number of years and seeing him do his thing and imply his trade work-related uh, wise there. We got to co-convene an event post-George Floyd, a town hall at Morgan State uh, to talk about all the things going on in the, in the not post-George Floyd, I'm sorry, uh um now I just went blank. This is terrible. This is embarrassing. Uh yeah, now I just went blank on the on that particular town hall, but um not George Floyd, of course. This is terrible. Anyway, come on in, everybody. Uh, Freddie Gray. That's right, of course, Freddie Gray. My goodness, after Freddie Gray's killing. Sorry, we had a town hall at Morgan State co-convene. I know there's so many name, people guessing names. This is so many. But it was, it was the Freddie Gray killing in Baltimore that sparked this particular town hall. Uh, and in fact, I can't wait to ask him about this because I saw him in, in my classes give his culture test challenging people on what they think they know about your Euro european versus african world uh, uh history and culture but but uh no, definitely was not oj <laughs> uh so yeah but anyway without further ado let me bring our guests up uh, uh i'm talking about dr kemet shockley by the way and maybe we can talk about this too because this i don't think is in his in this bio dr shockley is the co-convener of the classic debate between Malefi Asante and Kwame Ture at the University of Cincinnati back in the day, uh, where Dr. Shockley at the time, I believe, was a student. Uh, I don't know if in grad school yet. He can clarify that. And uh, uh, something I still use to this day in my classes uh, in, in terms of uh, introducing students to various approaches to radical solutions to African world problems. So, but Dr. Kemet Shockley, among other things, is, is a professor in the University of Houston College of Education. He is also co-executive director of the Ka Institute, which is an organization that does consulting, community building, creates documentary films, and creates educational content. Dr. Shockley is co has authored dozens of articles and five books focused on the education of Black children. His two most recent books are titled Campus Uprisings, published by Teachers College Press in 2020, and African-Centered Education Theory and Practice, published by Myers Education Press in 2020 as well. In addition to his work as a professor and researcher, he served as a middle school teacher, school leader, lecturer, filmmaker, and he is a board member and reviewer for several journals. Dr. Shockley holds a PhD in organizational leadership and policy 
from the University of Maryland at College Park. And he's here to talk with us about his new series, most recently uh, produced and, and uh, accessible through the link in the show description uh, on 2B TV, Cultural War Focus on Black Youth. Dr. Shockley, welcome back to the show. Good to see you again. Thank you very much. And Dr. Ball, Brother Jared, it's wonderful to see you again. And uh, it's just always good to join you on I Mix What I Like. You're right, we've been talking to each other for a long time. A long time. Uh, we went to the same uh, graduate school at the University of Maryland College Park. That's right. Yeah. Is that how yeah. we met? Was it through the grad school there? Uh, you know what, it might have been. Because I know I was, a, I, was a, I was as activist as a doctoral student can be. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I probably met you through some of the things that we were doing on campus. So it's, yeah, it's right always on. nice to talk to you. No, yeah, it's good to see you back again and doing doing good work. Uh, uh, I watched the series. It was good to see a number of folks involved and to, to see some of the, the discussion and the critique. I wanted to get you to start with just giving us an overview of what it is that you're you're conv you're talking about in this in this series, cultural war focus on black youth. If you would just give us your overview for those who haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, and uh, uh, tell us what you've what you've at least attempted to create here. What you've done? What have you done here, Doctor Shockley? Sure, sure. So this film, it, this is a, it's actually a docu series of five parts: cultural war focus on black youth. Um, one of the reasons that I created this film is because what's happening in education to black students is that the system of racism, white supremacy is trying to get our young people to replace, to, to be, I guess you could say, situated in the same way in the country as they have us currently situated as losers uh, in, the, in, the, in the war. Now, what this film does is explain to parents, teachers, community members, and others, the importance of knowing who you are and being prepared to fight in the system of racism, white supremacy for the upliftment of black people. So what that starts with is knowledge of self, knowledge of what has happened throughout history and knowledge of who you are individually and culturally. The educational system in the United States does everything it can to make sure that that does not happen. But unfortunately, many of us who have been through the system and maybe have a job or have some position in the society, forget that or, or have never had the perspective that just because you made it through it doesn't mean that it's good for us. And in fact, I think of the educational system in the United States as being only second to media and entertainment. If you're looking at this, the nine areas of people activity as laid out by Dr. Welsing and Neely Fuller, I think of education as only second to entertainment in its ability to cause brainwashing and cause problems for our young people. So I know they engage with a lot of media through social media and other media, uh, internet and television, the second most powerful thing again is education. So what's not happening is that we're not producing, a comp we're not competing properly with the white supremacist educational system. And right now we're losing to that system. And it's really a war for who's gonna control the minds of black people, who's gonna control the minds of black students, black young people who they know are extraordinarily creative and are able to set trends that move all around the world. And since that's the case, it's an issue of who's going to control those minds. So that is why we have a war. The other reason we have a war is because the system of white supremacy wants to turn Black people into something that's more palatable for them. They want to be able to use us in whatever ways they see fit. And they're using the educational system as a means to do that. Many of us, when we think of education and children, we think of a big yellow school bus, we think of uh, uh, summer breaks, we think of Christmas breaks, we think of you know getting a holiday moment around November and all these things, just innocent things. 
But in fact, education is not innocent. It is a political atmosphere. It is a political opportunity. And it is a war. It is the spot of a major war. Because that, because what happens there isn't just like big yellow bus and an apple and all that stuff. It's really who is going to have control of the minds of our young people. And right now we're not winning. So the docuseries is really focused on helping people, everybody, but especially people of African descent, to understand how that war is being fought, why it is that we're losing, how it is that, this, that the system of racism and white supremacy is winning. And I'm trying to offer solutions. The major solution to the problem of miseducation and our losing is if we can change our mindset from being what we probably think of as an individual mindset that we came up with on our own, which is really for most of us, a white supremacist mindset, a mindset that's geared toward making things right and possible and solving the problems for the pe people of European descent and moving us toward solving our own problems. So there are institutions and they're African-centered institutions. There's rites of passage programs that are African-centered where that work is being done. So I highlight a lot of the people in the film who are doing that work. And I highlight a lot of the people in the film who are also activists who are doing things that are, that are designed to to take us out of a loser's position. So the, so the film is really looking at the education of black children in a more holistic sense, the miseducation of black children, who is there that is, gonna, that is providing solutions to the problem and what can we do so that we don't put black children, as I said earlier, right back in the same position that we are in, serving in the system of racism, white supremacy and not moving a project forward that is good for people of African descent. That's that's the purpose, that's the scope of the film. And it took five uh, episodes to do that. And the film is available on Tubi. It's also available on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, and so I'm hoping that people will watch the film and gain some information, knowledge, and understanding of what it is that we must do in order to save ourselves from the system of white supremacy, continuing its legacy of turning people of African descent into uh, fodder for their project. Right on, thank you for that. I see some folks complaining about the volume of my mic. Uh, so I've, <laughs> I've made a slight adjustment. You all could let me know if this makes any difference. Uh, otherwise, uh, please bear with whatever these technical issues might be. Uh, so thanks for that. So so. Okay, so having said that, so this is where I found myself, I, uh, uh, I think a bit confused watching the series because, uh, so for instance, you, you, you point to as a solution, the importance of African culture, African-centered education. Uh, and throughout the series you use interchangeably, if I understood correctly, black and African culture were used sort of interchangeably. So if, if I misheard that and you would wanna draw any distinction, please do. But primarily what was what was part of the confusion was that you have a variety of political actors and figures involved as, as the talking head, so to speak, uh, whose perspectives, as I understand them, are not all on the same page and not necessarily even in agreement with with what I understand to be your your thesis. So, for instance, Tariq Nasheed, as I told you, was going to be the first off in terms of my question to you. All I see from Tariq is a hostility towards the African diaspora. That's what I'm seeing. A hostility, mm -hmm. particularly towards more recently, in terms of his 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 what I find disturbing uh, historical renditions of hip hop. This uh, this attack on Latin American contribution, and you have a portion where you draw in the distinction of Afro Latinos, and you bring that brother in to to make that point. So I'm just wondering. So so with Tariq in particular, I'm just wondering. I, where does his foundational Black American stance and argument fit in with your African-centered approach? So that's one question I had. Uh, um, I'm very interested in your response to that or thoughts sure. on that. Sure. You know, there are lots of people in the film who, who, are, who are on the same page as me. Then there are people in the film 
who I think bring really good ideas that might not be on the exact same page as I am. And to speak to Tariq Nasheed in, in, in particular, you know, Tariq, it was, let me just kind of do a, I'll go, go back just a bit. One of the things uh, that I could say is that Tariq Nasheed and I have never shared, fully shared the exact same philosophy. However, I took note of the fact that that he invited me on uh, uh, to, to be one of his folks that spoke uh, for his series that he does, uh, Hidden Colors. Now, what I spoke about on Hidden Colors has to do with African culture and African people and things that I always talk about. And, you know, it, it worked for the film, for the, for the part that I did, even though other people in the film were saying different things than what I said. One of the things that I've noticed is that Tariq has moved from a Pan-Africanist perspective, which is what he was doing when he was doing with, in his film, to what I understand is part of a B1 movement or a Black first movement that is centered on uh, Black Americans. So when I compare the two perspectives that relate to, I, I see two major perspectives right now that focus on the Black Americans mainly, and that is a civil rights movement and now the B1 movement. Those two movements have a lot of Black people's attention. Um, I see them as doing African-American work, where I see my own work as part of a pan-African work that really is involving both the United States as well as Africa and the diaspora, looking at the things that are happening with Black people. So the civil rights liberation principle, if, I, if you will, I see as being saying, let's get free by huddling up with our allies. Uh, the B1 movement, that's the, the movement that Tariq is part of. I see that uh, the liberation principle as let's huddle up and get with other black Americans. Uh, and then there's actually another movement and that's the assimilationist movement that says we don't need to huddle up at all because we just need to be, do, do exactly what white folks have told us to do, and then we'll be better. And then there's a pan-Africanist liberation principle, which is let's get free by huddling up with Black people worldwide. I think that the reason why many people are now interested in the B1 movement, which is, again, the movement that Tariq Nasheed is a part of, is because um, they, they believe that African-Americans have, have not had their energy matched in terms of their interest in pan african in terms of trying to be pan africanist so since the energy isn't matched and since there is a reparations claim that is forthcoming that i think is starting to build um, they said that folks in the b1 movement are saying let's move away from an interest in or advocacy for pan africanism and advocate for our own selves. And about a year and a half ago, one of my students sent an email because she, she knew that I was in the uh, Hidden Colors series. And she sent me, an, uh, a, a, I guess, a, a piece that Tariq had done on his show. And she was asking me a similar question. What do you think about this? And I had not heard some of this stuff that, that he was saying. So that was the first I'd heard of it. And I looked then at about four different things that Tariq produced that were focused on that. And I was watching particularly to see there's a move away from Pan-Africanism and toward the B1 perspective. Let me listen in and really pay attention to what's happening. And what I noticed is that when he's speaking to people who call into his show, he is not against I haven't heard him speak against Africans or other Black people in the diaspora. What he does is what the people in the B1 movement do. And that is, if your energy towards African Americans is one way, then they meet and match that energy with name calling and other things that I wouldn't do, but they match it with the same energy. Uh, so I, ha I have not heard in the four episodes that I reviewed, where there is an off offense going on offense against other Black people. I heard a sort of defense looking at, okay, so if Black Americans are supposed to be lazy, 
then I'm going to come at you with the stereotypes that they have against your group. And as silly as all of it is, that is an approach uh, that 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 is being taken. And again, it's not the pan-Africanist approach, but it is an approach. Um, and I think that I think what we're going to have to do is to acknowledge the fact that the reason that that particular movement has caught the captured the imagination of so many black people, particularly black young people, is because we haven't been successful at actually uh, getting our people all around the world on board with loving each other and going and thinking of ourselves outside of the context that the system of white supremacy has uh, provided for us to think about each other. And so we're going to have to do that work. And perhaps taking a, a, a more energy matching kind of approach to the Pan-Africanist work, which I don't think that's necessarily what they're trying to do. But if, you, if I think about it as a Pan-Africanist, I say, well, the approach that Pan-Africanists have taken is to always speak in unifying ways about wanting all of us to come together as a group. Well, there's now another energy that exists that says, if even though my perspective isn't that uh, African Americans have been interested in Pan Africanism, but other groups of people have not. That's not my perspective. But if that is a person's perspective, there are now two different approaches uh, at at looking at that. One is the Pan Africanist approach, which is let's just unify. Another approach that the B1 folks are doing is since you're not going to come and unify with us, we, we're going to do our own thing. Now, which one of those will, will win? Which one of those will be the thing to bring unity? My hope is that the system of racism, white supremacy doesn't use the things that the B1 movement are doing is doing to, uh, to drive us further apart because they're really good at that. So that's my concern. Uh, I also think, though, that uh, perhaps when you bring something to somebody in a less unifying way, can that bring more unity? Can you can can saying to them, why are you thinking of us in stereotypical ways that were given to you by the system of white supremacy? Why are you thinking of us in that way, particularly and especially when you come to the United States? Uh, will that approach be more successful? I don't know. I'm not sure. But it has captured the imagination of our younger people and a lot of black folks who are not younger. And so I think we just have to accept the fact that it's there and we have to understand it. Now, when finally, when Tariq spoke on the, the docuseries, nothing that he said goes against the, the principles and values of Pan-Africanism uh, as I see it, and I don't think any other Pan-Africanists that have reviewed the film mentioned anything of that nature. So I don't, I don't think that there is an effort. I, I guess in summary, I don't think that there is an effort necessarily to go against people of African descent. Is The response to people who come into the United States as immigrants, I think there is a response that's being offered to the the sort of decision of some people to attach to the stereotypes about African-Americans. And uh, we're going to have to deal with that because there's thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of black people who are now on board with a different response to those, to those things that are actually, to those things that we're dealing with as a community. So thank you for that. And I don't, I don't mean for us to belabor this. It's not, you're not here to defend anyone else's, uh, so one, I, just a couple of things. The reason I think Tariq's comments on your series won't draw the ire of a Pan-Africanist who sees it without knowing who Tariq is, is because he's only in there enough to say the culture of education in US schools is anti-Black. So that's, that's right. and that's nobody, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And this is sort of my problem with, you're calling it the B first or B1 movement. I understand him to be the FBA. Found, so if I use that, I don't want to, that's who I'm talking about, the foundational black Americans, uh, uh, which I believe he fought legally to trademark if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, um, but my point is, is that they and other variants of that take the reality take a piece of that thread of reality 
the anti-blackness in American education and go in a very rightward conservative direction. That's my issue. So, and that's where I see the conflict and the contradiction in your series, because you're promoting African-centered education. And with all due respect, if you look beyond whatever four episodes you watched, if you look at his other episodes, if you look at his Twitter timeline, if you just look at his, his, his engagement with the African world and Pan-Africanism as a concept, it is very hostile. And part of that is, I think, because he and many others like him do not come at this from a, a history of Pan-African activism in which they would have said to the point you were raising, we've made this earnest attempt to build with Africans in the world and they've just rejected us. And therefore we've decided, no, 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 no. They're following a very white supremacist, anti-black colonial thread that has always wanted to be a divisive element this dis, divisive element in the pan-African or African world community looking to cut, in this case, Black America off from the diaspora so that all we have left is uh, obeisance and, a, and, 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 and uh, um, uh, a lack of power in relation to this white supremacist country as opposed to a power base of, Af of an African world. So that's where... So that's where I was where I was immediately struck with, you know, here you are promoting African centered education. He would never. I've never seen or been aware of him advocating for for that sort of approach uh, because he wouldn't want an African worldview in 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 his very black American movement. Uh, so that's that was um, that was where I was going with that. And if you would like, I'm, I'm happy to have you respond to any of that, but uh, I'm also happy to move on because I know that's not what you're here to do. I'll just right. say just briefly. Sure, I sure, think. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I understand uh, what you're saying. Now, like I said, when I look at the different movements, and I think the larger movement there is a B, they call it the Black First Movement. Okay. And gotcha. I think that Tariq's preference for the naming of people of African descent in the United States is FBA. But the, but there's a larger group of people who are a part of a black first movement, but the American is actually silent. Black America first movement. Uh, and so it's, for me, it's it's yet another thing that uh, for, as a Pan-Africanist, we, we, we work with different groups of folks and we work with the mentality of people of African descent in the United States and around the world to try to move toward what we want, which is a Pan-African, which is Pan-African ideology. And what we've never done in the Pan-Africanist movement is to sort of say, well, because the civil rights movement is different than what we believe in, we're, we're not going to deal with that or we're, we're, we're going to sort of isolate from those Black people. The Pan-Africanist has always tried to push an idea that where we are really in, in the African-centered world even, uh, said, well, consider these ideas, consider these African-centered ideas, consider the origins of who we are as people of African descent, consider that, uh, you know, uh, Imhotep is the world's first math, his first mathematician, not Pythagoras. Now, we've got Black people who will still think that the first philosopher was Plato, Aristotle, and, and Socrates, Those were the, but we, we also, our movement has forwarded that, no, the first philosophers were actually people like Patahotep. Uh, and so we we forward that against the system of white supremacy. And we also forward that in relation to what's happening with, with black people who, who, fall, who fall for them or who believe that we have accomplished nothing in history. And we take, I take the same approach to the B1 movement. While I have a different set of ideas, uh, currently, that movement has got a lot of traction among young people. And so I wouldn't take the perspective that, um, that, that it's something to sort of think of in a negative way and then put it away, but instead to continue to push the ideas that I have as a Pan-Africanist in hopes that we can move people toward African-centered education. Um, that's what I would say. You know, I just think it's uh, I think it's important for those of us who are Afrocentric and those of us who are Pan-Africanists, we have to work with the community and anti anti African centeredness and anti Pan-Africanism come in lots of different, you know, sort of packages. 
and, and right now, the package that's most attractive, I think, as a movement is probably that B1 movement. Hundreds of thousands of followers and listeners across the different people who um, who, who are, I guess, uh, listeners and of, of, of the people in that movement, not just Tariq. And so when a movement uh, captures the attention of the people in that way, it's my job as, as an activist for our community and as a, as a thinker and as an African-centered person to see what it is they're actually trying to do and give them a chance to talk and then bring community together. The very thing that you're supposed to be doing when you're a Pan-Africanist is the idea is acceptance of Black people, understanding, trying to find ways to listen. Uh, now, individuals do lots of different things within you know, other movements. Civil rights folks have done lots of things that have turned a lot of people off from civil rights movement. Uh, there are people in the civil rights movement who have committed atrocities against women and other folks. Um, you know, my, my perspective on that is what are your principles? Uh, and let me try and deal with you on the principles that you say are important to you. Not necessarily an individual and, and looking at what an individual does, but what are the principles of the movement that you are espousing? And, you know, it's, uh, it's important for us to understand that. If, if, if we had better know what the B1 movement is doing. It is probably the more- the I most agree. Black America. On that, I agree. <laughs> we better know what they're doing. And that's why I'm saying I'm encouraging you to pay a little bit more attention because a lot of that popularity is driven by them being algorithmically and politically friendly to a media environment that wants to promote anti-Black, anti-Pan-African disunity. They are, they are supported by a very white supremacist conservative politic that is happy to see them platform to be given space in the New York Times and other major platforms to talk about uh, a, a version of, of, of black leadership and struggle that this society and this state has been struggling against forever. It's been looking in, in, in their context, looking to promote forever. So it's, 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 that's absolutely, I'm in full agreement that we should know more about what they're advocating and doing because what they're telling people I see it, the students, my, my students reflect this. I see it in the popularity. I see it in the hostility we've received. I've received directly in some cases that they're saying, we're not interested in this old form of African unity and Pan-Africanism. And we're not interested in certainly uh, uh, militant forms of Pan-African black radical organization. They're interested in, a, in ultimately a very conservative uh, um, almost sole allegiance to the United States as the sol as the solution to their problems through reparations, and that's and that's it, it, that's where they see the salvation for the black community inclusion in this very white supremacist state, which is again where I see the contradiction in what I understand you and your work to be about, and that's why when I see him pop up. So the idea that he would build his career to a certain extent, that is Nasheed on this idea of Pan-Africanism, talking about Dr. Clark, whose literal last statement was Pan-Africanism or perish, and then be so condemnatory and hostile to African everything is, again, very concerning to me. So yes, on that we agree. We should be much more aware of what is being said and and the and why it's popular among our our communities and why and people we want to build with, but I think we do disagree on. We, we disagree. We, you and I have always yeah. had some disagreements. All good. <laughs> All good. Absolutely. We always yeah. and I and I have praised you for years in being. You gave me a pass, Doctor Shockley. I will always praise you for that. I was I was way out of pocket with you at a conference gathering once. And you were very gracious in your past to me. And I, well, I will you, always be apologetic. You look back on this and see. <laughs> I was the, not wrong. I was no, not wrong me, politically. I, My okay, analysis well, was not wrong. <laughs> but let me say this, though. I think wherever, I, I get that, wherever our young people are going, I got to I gotta go over there and see what's going on. I've got to. I, okay. I, and I've got to see, uh, as a, I'm an educationist, I, I'm a, a, a black nationalist, pan-Africanist, Afrocentric person. I, if black young people are more attracted to something else other than that, then I have to, I have to deal with that thing. 
And um, that's that's the idea here is, is you know, okay. I don't necessarily, I don't know, some of it, your, your idea that they are um, pandering to, I guess, the system of racism, white supremacy, I've seen them critique the system of racism, white supremacy. Um, I've seen them use Dr. Welsing's ideas in some of the work that they do. And but, but people besides uh, besides Tariq, I've, I've also sure. watched some of the other folks who are who are doing things in that particular movement. I mean, it really is just the same as like a, looking at the hip hop movement. If I say, well, look at some of the things that are happening in the hip hop movement. There are things happening over there that are problematic. Uh, there are things that the people in the hip hop movement are doing that I think shed light on things that are important to consider. Our young people are attracted to it. So my job is to know as a researcher, what's going on over there? What good is coming out of that? How can we use it? And how can we use it to move anything forward? What can I, what, what can I do to attract the attention of some of those people to consider some Pan-Africanist and African-centered principles? Not just to say, well, you, you're, you're written off, you know, but to say, well, what, you know, what, what, what's there? I do see some things in that B1 movement that I, I can see why it would be more attractive. And some of it has to do with the ways that people of African descent think all around the world in relation to uh, sometimes <laughs> a quest toward tribal tribal thinking and behavior. Uh, my group, my, me, we're great. That I see in groups of Africans all over the place, not, not just the B1, but that's essentially one of the things they're responding to is people coming to the United States and saying, I'm from I'm from Nigeria, I'm from Ghana or whatever. And so it's us. And then we're going to kind of have a thing with you. My, but my, there's no analysis of why. they. But that's my point. That movement does not have an analysis of why certain continental Africans come here with certain attitudes. So there's no class analysis, for instance, of the continental Africans who come here. There's, and to the point I was making initially, there's no basis in actual activism or world travel that would give them any other experience or encounter with continental Africans other than the handful of the bougie that come over here with these attitudes. So that's my point. And certainly, a radical pan-Africanist would not respond to some bougie Nigerian coming over here with some bougie Nigerian analysis and tell Nigerians that their sole solution to their problem is to further ensconce themselves and solely wed themselves to the British. No one would do that. And yet the, the, the so-called be first movement, that is their ultimate analysis and conclusion that our sole uh, savior is the good white American Uncle Sam that will protect us as an American from the rest of these savages coming over here trying to get what we deserve. It is, it is, it is be so my point is they absolutely will make use of reference to Malcolm X and Dr. King and Dr. Clark and Francis Cress Welsing, and then they drag it all the way over to the most rightward an upside down backwards conclusion. And that's why, again, they when you are promoting an African-centered education, and again, I'm happy for us to move on to talk more about that. Yeah, this is a good the, conversation to me. I mean, no, no, we can say here, I'm just saying, they are decidedly against it. That's what I'm, that, and, and, and again, this is not, I'm not just talking about Tariq here, and I'm not just talking about from even a, a, a passing engagement with this community. This is, I, I'm, I'm speaking with some degree of experience and having paid some degree of attention for, for a, a period of time that, that I, I, so I do, again, I will, we, I want us, that point where we do agree is I want us to pay more attention to what they're actually saying. Uh, we had, the, we debated them on here. We had a group come on here a couple of years ago. They're not interested in, in what you, what you would talk about. They're not interested. They don't want. To, they don't want to hear from Imhotep. Yeah. They don't want. They don't want to hear from Hotep. They're condemning yeah. Hotep's. I was glad you had that part in there to remind us who Hotep really was, because they'll be one of the first ones to use it in the negative to say, "Oh, y'all some Hotep's. We don't want that." Go ahead. I mean, sorry. Well, I'm just gonna say that there are. I I've heard people who are a part of that movement speak against people who call people hoteps, you know? And so I, I don't, I don't think everybody in that particular group of folks is the same type of person. I don't sure. think everybody's of the course. same, just like not all Pan-Africanists are, are the same. 
Um, so but I don't, and I, I also think that there is more possibility of, I don't want to use the word recruiting, but working with, I'll say, people from that movement than some of the other ideas that are floating around in the black community, uh, such as assimilation, uh, such as people who are, assim we have a lot of assimilationists. We have a lot of people who are, um, who are, who are sort of, I don't want to use the word Negro, but I'll say Negro civil rights folks who really don't have, like recently Jim Clyburn just got upset with some black folks who were asking about uh, reparations and told them to go F themselves or something like that and get the F away from him. Uh, and, you know, people just basically being nasty. So, uh, and, and also people who don't, who are just as against, if not more against African centered education than people in that particular B1 movement. Uh, so you're right. That is, a, for me, it's a problem. The, the ideologies that are not about bringing us to an African centered place so that we can win. That's a problem for me. But I have never taken the approach that the these different ideologies are ones that to shut down, well, in the sense of ignoring them or saying that since you don't agree with me, I'm not going to be able to interact with you and or work with you. But you've got our kids over there. Since you have our kids over there, it's in my best interest to understand what you're talking about and then present some other things for us to consider. I mean, that's been my approach since I was really young. I mean, even you mentioned that I put together the debate between Malefi Asante and um, Kwame Ture. That was the same thing. That was when I was an undergraduate and I was probably 19 years old or something like that. I was an Afrocentric person and still am. But I created this debate because we need to hear, we got these ideas in our community that sort of more match up a lot of people with what, what uh, Kwame Ture was talking about. So we put the debate together, gave people a chance to listen to both sides, gave people a chance to listen and, and to learn from, from what even the side that I wasn't as agree, uh, in agreement on, the Kwame Ture side. We've got both of these people, groups in our community. Let's listen to both. And I think. And then B1 want, comes in and says, we don't want either one of them suckers. Both of them right. suckers are wrong. All of them are wrong. I say That's what I think is fat. I'm saying that the B1 community comes in and says both Tere and Asante are wrong. I mean, the assimilationists would say the same. No, uh, you know, yeah, but but what does that have? I'm not. Nobody's talking about assimilationists. I'm not. The I'm not I'm bringing them up is because I see it as a milieu of different ideas in the black community. Right, there but you didn't have a Clyburn people. representative speaking in your series. You well, wouldn't have an assimilation well, assimilation. I, well, I do, I do have an assimilationist in my in my. I series. was going to say, I have a yeah, you're right. And assimilationist yeah, you're right. In my you're right. All yeah. right, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying is, I have always been a person who is like, "What are you talking about?" I don't uh, do like Fox News, where I say I'm only mm. going to have people a part of what with, who agree with this perspective. I am, I really do want to bring the people's voices together because nobody's one voice is going to be just so winner. Somebody's just going to win at the end and you're going to have everybody on your side. The black community will always have a mix of different voices. I want to hear all those voices and present mine, a Pan-Africanist, African-centered voice as well and have people consider that because I think we've done lots of good in education in particular. What we've established in the Pan-Africanist Pan and African-centered movement is a solution to miseducation. But largely the, the way that we, we've actually, we've actually come with something that works. I don't know if people think of it like that, but you wouldn't be able to prove otherwise. What we've done is create a solution. We created a solution to miseducation. The solution to that is, 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 is African-centered education. That's the reason for this series that I created. And lots of different types of voices are in that series. I would say a third of the people in the series agree with Kimmett's way of thinking about education. There's a lot of people in the series who I do, you know, I do not uh, agree with even the majority of their work. But that doesn't mean that the work that they do doesn't have utility for black people and that some black people would attach to the way they think about things. 
see, and the other thing that people do with the African Center people is they leave us out. <laughs> so they'll have a whole conference and then not invite a single person who's African centered to speak. So that isolation that you're doing when we are the people coming with a solution to the problem, but you've isolated us to say, since we're not talking about black excellence and we're instead demonstrating the need for black people to, to, to be the African people they are, you're leaving us out. You're not hearing from us. A whole audience of people are not getting that education. And I don't want to be that type of, uh, of activist in the black community. I want to be the type of person who says, well, if I can't capture you, maybe who can? And I see some negatives that people in the B1 movement are talking about. They're negative to me because I'm not in that movement. But I also see them raising a conversation that the Pan-Africanists can't raise. We can't raise a genuine conversation about the negative ideas that people come to the United States with. Because when we start talking, what people hear is, we know that you're for the diaspora. When, when those people start talking, they're saying, why do you come here with this attitude? And then you start hearing people repeat the negative attitudes. And so then they can have a conversation about that. And I do think that one of the things that may happen is that we'll begin to see that we're all under the same system that is harming every last one of us because the conversation can be a little bit more genuine is because of the, the their approach is energy matching. So, so, but I just, just I, I do not agree that the Pan African community isn't heard because we're seen as representing the diaspora. We're seen as representing the diaspora because our opponents in the B1 movement have been more well platformed and supported by our enemies to capture the minds of our target audience better than we are able to because we're on the winning correct side. So I, I just want to be so I just I, I, I don't want to just leave it with it's it's somehow the Pan-Africanists that are failing and the other side is doing something that. great. They're being, or, well, I mean, but in terms of being of reaching a larger audience, you were saying we're not able to do something they're able to do. And that's not because of anything wrong with us. It's because they have the support of a state and its algorithms that want that message. They have yeah. explicitly. OK. All right, real quick, you you mentioned uh, again that you put together the Tere Asante debate. I did want to ask uh, um, if you have any thoughts about the current struggles to, uh, Asante is facing. I, I ju it just uh, I just mm -hmm. noted that uh, you know uh, the struggles he's having with Temple, and then over the last year or so, the split even with his, his own organization or parts of his organization. Uh, do you have any, are you following that? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, yeah. A bit before I mention that, I don't know, I don't know if, um, I will say that I'll be at Temple tomorrow, actually, uh, showing a part of the film and having some discussion at one o'clock in Gladfelter Hall, room 812. Um, so if anybody's listening in Philadelphia, please come on through. Um, you know, to me, it's, one of the things that I see happening in uh, among black people who work together, right? And I've worked with some people uh, before that I no longer work with and work with people that I still work with. <laughs> and one of the things that happens is that uh, it takes a lot of energy uh, when you're working with somebody who has strong ideas uh, to stay unified and still work with them through the, 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 the ideas thing. I don't see what has happened there as being very much different. What I don't have is the inside of Asante's brain or inside of the other folks' brain. Well, I'm a Mazama and other folks. I'm not inside of their mind to know what else is there besides just a difference of uh, philosophy, if you will. Because I understand that a lot of the, the breakdown has, has started with a difference in philosophy. Uh, that it, it wasn't somebody doing something to somebody, et cetera. It was actual philosophy. Um, so how do you keep two people who are very strong in their philosophy and in their approach to things together? It's hard. Uh, it's very difficult to do so. But if there's inside reason, if there's besides philosophy, I don't, I'm not uh, privileged to know what else could possibly be there. All I can hope is that at some point, they'll be able to reconcile that. 
lot of times, sometimes these things don't get reconciled. That maybe an elder who is also a part of the African Center community can step in and and try to help uh, mend some of the fissures that are there. Um, if there's there may be other people out there who know more about what has happened there, but just looking at it uh, from more of an out as more of an outsider who appreciates the work of both of the parties and of Afrocentricity International and of the MK Asante organization of which I've been, you know, uh, not only invited to do work with in the past, but also been awarded by both of those uh, organizations and institutions, et cetera. I would say my just, I just hope that they uh, can work it out, but I know how hard it is when you have a lot of ideas that, you know, people are trying to work through their differences and ideas. So that's all I can really say on it. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Yeah. I appreciate that, given your uh, experience. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, wow, it's already 11.50. Uh, <laughs> so we're coming up on an hour. How are you on time before I pick the next question? Well, uh, I have about I have about 20 minutes left uh, that I can right, well, do. I just want to note that we always have some great discussions. It's so interesting. Oh, no, me. I do. That's what I'm saying, man. I'm, I'm <laughs> I miss you not being on the yard. I miss you not being around. You know, I, I've I've always enjoyed rapping with you. And again, we we're not on the same page. But I've I've never found it except for that one moment, which was my fault. And again, I apologize. Years ago, it's never been a problem for us to disagree. And in fact, I, yeah. I I've had more fun disagreeing with you than I have agreeing with a lot of people that I talk to in agreement. So I, I, yeah. I you know, I just you know, um, but. Okay, so, uh, okay. Well, one thing is in episode two of the series, uh, you identified that that single handedly white women are ruining education. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> no, no, it's just no, no, no. There was a segment. There was a, it was a part of episode two where where it, it I, I jokingly wrote that you you identified that white women were single handedly running both running <laughs> and ruining. Uh, the education of black youth. Uh, um, I don't really have a point. I just wanted to make note that I made a joke about that. In, in well, we do know that was, yeah, uh, yeah, somewhere yeah. near about 84% of the teachers yeah. of black students are white women. We also have a white woman in the docuseries who right. actually says that. She That's says, what I'm saying. That she was the one saying it. Right. She says that white, white, if white women are the teachers of black youth, and we know black youth are continuously being stomped down, then white women are responsible because of their racism. And that's what she said. And, you know, I'm and not you here saw to no argue. reason to edit that out. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I work with, with white women in education. I'm not. <laughs> and one of the things that I always try to impress upon them is looking at think reality. You know, what is the reality of the situation that black children are in? And, it, and, and they will take responsibility, the ones who are really honest and who really want to look at things for what they are, for, because they say they don't know. And so that's, they take my class, I hope at the end of the class they know. Uh, then you have ones who want to be in doubt and who are offended by any and everything that might be said. Now I will note that I used to have way more white women falling apart and get crying and being upset and writing certain kinds of comments on my teaching evaluations years ago, now they're, they're a little bit more willing to say, yeah, I, this is a problem and I don't understand this community. Even more people sort of saying that because of some things that have come out, which I also credit to the African Center community for its work. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult topic to, to, to deal with and to get into with, with white women because they, are, they know that they're the majority teachers of black, black youth and many of them also know that because of their lack of knowledge about what's going on in black communities, they also are responsible for a lot of the stuff that's been going on. And in terms of what people know, you do bring some empiricism to it because I, I've even witnessed it in my own classroom where you give a ver at least a version of, of, of what you call your culture test. Uh, and I loved seeing in this series, you have footage of mm -hmm. public school teachers around the country, white, black, et cetera, others, whoever, um taking this test the only f problem my my biggest critique of that part of the, the the series is you don't show us what the test is i would have loved to be reminded 
and I don't know if it's because it's proprietary or whatever, but I was well, like, show us the t like the questions that are being asked. Well, and, and actually, there is a moment yeah. where I show the first ten questions of really. Of, yeah, you might you might not have noticed it, but the first ten questions of the Eurocentric and the Afrocentric test are shown in that same sort of segment area. Oh, I didn't. It's, yeah. Oh, my bad. I didn't see that. I was looking for. Okay, my fault. I uh -huh, must, yeah. yeah. But if you would say a word about this culture test, uh, that, that well, you know, yeah. one of the people that inspired that that culture test was a guy named Fahim Ashanti, who has a book called "The Psychotechnology of Brainwashing." And in that book, he presents what he calls the Ashanti test of brainwashing. And um, I have taken some of the questions that he that he used. I always give him good credit for his work. And um, I use some of the questions from him. And then I also mix in some things that us as an African centered education folks that we think people should know about. Uh, and then. I've used some some sort of uh, measurement and statistics people to help me figure out, well, how, how can I make sure that the, the nature of the questions are the same and that I'm not way over here with this type of question and way over here. And they've helped me with some of that over the years. So the purpose of that test is really to highlight the fact that we are very ignorant in, large, in many ways about our own history and culture and that other people, because I've given the test to all kinds of racial groups, are ignorant of African history and culture. And, and, and so one of the things that that does is it helps people to see, like you said, to some, to some degree with some empiricism, that you really don't know anything about black people, but you have lots and lots of opinions about black people. And that's to black people too. You have all these ideas, you have these opinions, you have these thoughts, but really you don't know who we are. And sometimes what it does is it helps the person to see Maybe I should learn more before I speak so much. Uh, and so I think that's the that's one of the goals of it. I've given that test. I don't know. Now it's hundreds and hundreds of times when I do professional development and just other times. Um, and in almost every case, everybody fails the black history test and they pass the white history test. There are about 25 questions on the test that I gave to the people in the film. Those were teachers from all over the country. I only put about four, but I also tested teachers in about six other places, but it, it was beginning to get monotonous. Um, so I just showed about four cities and in each city, it was the exact same. There was not a city <laughs> where we had more than one person pass the black history test. Not, and not, these are not. black teachers. These are white. Again, it's not. It's not like the black teachers all got a hundred and the white teachers all failed. Everybody was failing. Everybody fails. That's part history. of what you were showing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of the work that I do is with black teachers, and I give them a test, and and they almost always fail it. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a mix of people. I had Asians. I had Latinos. Lots of people took that test and they actually failed the test. So. Uh, every, almost everybody fails the black history test. And most people pass the white test, the white culture test, but there are a few times when people fail the white cultural test as well. Uh, so yeah, it's it's unfortunate because what is the question I always ask is what does this all mean for black students? And I asked that question in the doc series. What does it really mean? Especially for a community of people, everybody has something to say something about. Uh, but but you don't but you don't even know you don't know us. And sometimes we don't know us, but still have all this to say. So uh, we're in trouble. And I think that there are lots of people who are doing great work. Um, I point in the film, I have Haki and Safisha Matabudi at their school in Chicago talking. And I think they do are doing fantastic work. I show um, Walimu Barudi at his school in Atlanta, who is doing fantastic work working with our young people. I highlight a brother named Samori Kamara. I have my good friend Tashango. Brother Samori, I got I, I want to give Tashango his room because that's another uh, brother I know at least a little bit. But Samori, I, I was happy to see him because folks are, you know, this current iteration, what you all are watching here called Black Power Media is really not the original Black Power Media. Black Power Media on YouTube was originally co-founded by that brother Samori. 
mm. uh, uh, at one point. Uh, so we had to honor uh, uh, him and some of his comrades, in, 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 including Brother Tafari, when we set this up. So, so mm -hmm. we're, yeah, so shout out to him for that. And then, yes, yeah, please do continue with, with a shout out to, to Brother Tashango. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brother Tashango and Billy Shaka, who just does great work working with our young people at various different institutions across the country. And uh, and they, they give him so much hell and havoc over it. I also uh, note uh, there's a sister, um, <clears throat> I always forget her name for some reason, but she was a principal of a school in Kansas City. Uh, yeah, where, the when, where they took her school, right? That's the one. The sister, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll think of her name in a minute, but the school was called Chick Elementary School, something that she started where she had the students just outperforming all racial groups in the state. And they found a reason to take that school. Um, ah, you know, I'll think of her name. Then there's uh, also, I have in, in, the, in the film, um, another woman who started a school in Lansing, Michigan, and just had the kids doing great, great things, but they ended up taking the school in Lansing, Michigan, causing her so many problems. I even put up a newspaper article that talked about uh, the work that she was doing. And so I think that what people need to see is when I say it's a war, it really is a war. As even when we're doing well, it's not like they just say, oh, that school is doing well, so leave it alone. No, start doing well, and they want to shut you down. And then uh, there's a brother in Chicago that I highlight, uh, and I highlight one of his students who wants to be a doctor and how he's already memorized almost every single part of the human body and what it does. And he's at the time of filming was seven years old. And so when I say that the African centered folks have so, some real solutions to, to these, to these issues, these problems, I mean it. And I think that, that at some point the, the, the community is going to have to recognize that we actually have a, have a solution to this and that we should get our children enrolled in these schools and looked at some of the people that I pointed out just now and some of the institutions and, and, and support these institutions with a tithe as we do in church and now offering as well, you know, folks do it at their churches. Really give these folks some support because they have a solution to the problem. So, but this was, okay, so we'll have to continue this because I know we don't have time to fully get to this whole discussion, but I want to raise it and, and I'll let you, I'll say what I have to say and then you can have the last word as we, we start to head towards a conclusion here. But I don't know how you remember it, but I unfortunately think about that, that, that negative exchange that I inspired between us years ago in Atlanta because... Mm -hmm not because I think I was wrong politically, but just behaviorally. But I do remember that one of the, the what, I, what I remember sort of, not as an excuse, but pushing me over the edge in our exchange was this question over implementation. Hmm. And one of the issues that I remember raising was as soon as black people start behaving in a way that takes them off of their sort of off of the grid of their role within this political economy, there's going to be state repression and hostility. So that that's this idea that that black people could sort of retreat into an African centered world and just behave as an African centered people in and in, in create a new world within before that we didn't know about a Wakanda at the time, but this was this discussion was pre Wakanda. <laughs> but like could create what would be considered a Wakanda today was part of where I was like, I don't see that, that that's not. So when I watched your series, I admit thinking that's my point when these sisters get their schools taken because not because they were doing something wrong per se, but because, well, in a sense they were in that they were producing well thinking and, 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 and culturally sane human beings that, that this society doesn't want. And so the state came in to get rid of them. Uh, when when I see, and the, even more broadly speaking, when part of what I understood the solution being promoted in your series was encouraging, as you just said, more support for these extra institutional schools. That is, in other words, they're you know they're ultimately private schools that need more support. Black people don't have any money, don't have certainly the resources necessary to do that at the level that would would serve all of the black children in this country. So ultimately what ends up happening is a handful get access to these brilliant schools and teachers 
uh, often there's a class association related to this as well, where the majority of the black community will never have access uh, uh, or the resources to be able to fund this many schools too. So that's why when I saw, for instance, um, some praise for for the private educational process, but you would, but but in almost contradiction to the history you raise in the series, where it was black people post enslavement, so to speak, who were pushing for education and saying we don't have the resources, so the state must fund it. Meaning that what we now know of as public education really comes from the struggle for black freedom in this country. So I say all that to say, how are how do you see this this work of implementing mass African centered education when we see the state's hostility to it, when we know black people don't have the resources to build schools autonomously and independently? And even if they did, the state isn't going to allow that to, to, to thrive without some sort of conflict is for lack of a better. So I say all that to say, talk about the implementation of the the, the plan as you see it. Mm -hmm. And I did remember her name, Audrey Bullock. Yeah, <laughs> the principal right of Chick right Elementary, on. Audrey Bullock. And the brother was Marcus uh, Klein. Uh, right, and so, Marcus has actually been on this platform, so shout out to him as well. Uh, okay, yeah, great, yeah. great. All right, so I, 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 it's a great question, actually. I think that the approach of the African centered in the African centered education movement is more sort of an intergenerational transmission thing. So what people in the African-centered education movement understand is that yes, they may shut down Andre Bullard's school, but however many students that she was able to impact while the school was open, those students have been impacted. We also know that uh, some schools, they're, they're not gonna shut down. Uh, Marcus, Marcus Klein's school is still open. Uh, we also know that you know the Nation House is still open in Washington, D.C., even though uh, Baba Ajay uh, transitioned. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we never think in terms of affecting the mass, but we end up affecting the mass. So even with some of the ideas, there was a time when the cultural nationalists and the African-centered people would be talking about white supremacy and people would say, that is insane. Not all white people are running around with a skinhead and doing this, that, and the other. Now look at what has happened is that everybody talks about white supremacy. Everybody, it's common now to, to mention white supremacy, whereas it used to just be a few of us. I can remember 20 years ago, 20, even 15 years ago, I was a person talking about white supremacy and people would think that that meant you're a fringe person who is just over the top. Racism, yes, but not white supremacy. Really, we take the same same approach uh, in, in the African-centered uh, education movement that it may look like we only have a small group of folks that we're impacting, but we affect the, the entire Black education apparatus is being affected by what African-centered education people are doing. Um, we're not as uh, powerful as the system of white supremacy. As I said at the beginning, the system of white supremacy is currently winning. <clears throat> However, the most formidable opponent to the system of white supremacy is what these folks who are only really looking, who are really, who looks like we're just doing a small, small, small thing, and we are small, but it is formidable for them because it's based in truth. So since we're basing what we're doing in truth, they're not able to fully stop it. Uh, <clears throat> and so... The other thing is that a lot of the people who are in the African-centered education movement are the people who originate a lot of the ideas that people who are more who are, who are better at getting attention for the things they do. They're getting these things from, from people in that movement. Uh, and a lot of the consciousness raising and new ideas, thing, ideas people think are new that have actually been around for a long time have been started by people who started schools that were that are African centered and people who are in that movement? So we we don't we never worry so much about uh, trying to massify. We're concerned about the masses, but not concerned about trying to massify, because we know how ideas spread. 
we know that a lot of the times that people who start those ideas don't get credit for those ideas. And we know that, for example, there are people who would speak today very negatively about African-centered thinking and African-centered education, but when they do their work, they're using the work from African-centered people. Uh, so there are people in education who do that all the time. They're against Africa, they're against African-centeredness, but I see them do professional development and they use the very things that they say they're against in the professional development that they do. And white people pay them lots of money to come in and do those things because it's more palatable. I've even had people tell me uh, when I've done peak professional development in schools, well, maybe you should just not call it African. So they want me to help them steal, you know? And, and you know, and I, I've had people who I know who are African centered, unfortunately, this is sad, say, well, I just don't use that word when I'm doing it. I don't say African centered so that way I can still reach the people. You don't understand that you're part of what George G.M. James calls the stolen, you're, you're helping aid and abet in the stolen legacy. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on and uh, a lot of times people are just anti-Black, they're anti-African. Uh, and we, we, we will reach the masses. Uh, it will be done as, as the white supremacist system continues to bear down on Black people and take away some of the things that we've grown comfortable with, such as DEI, affirmative action. Uh, we weren't really benefiting from affirmative action that much, but as they continue to bear down on Black people, which is the only thing they're trying to, they're not bearing, trying to bear down on people of color, not trying to bear down on Asians, Latino. They're trying to bear down on black people. And as they do that, black people will come looking for solutions to that. And when they come looking for solutions, they will find that there's only one right now in education and that's African-centered education. Uh, so that's another way that we recruit. We recruit because white people and the white supremacist system, those people who are doing these evil deeds, um, force Black people to come home sometimes. I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I am. By the way, by the way, you, you, just quickly, you, you mentioned, I was sorry to hear you mention that somebody jacked you for your video in Detroit. Oh, it, yeah. It, you mentioned that. Is there any update you can give since the series came out? You mentioned it in there that you, you got some good footage and then the videographer wanted to get during so, the time there, we were yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a group of of uh, of a black male this was all black male teachers in detroit i mean they were throwing it down i don't know it was just really good and i was like wow this is going to go so well on the docu series i couldn't find a videographer uh in detroit so someone recommended this guy and he came in he is white and he was seemingly uncomfortable to me and to others during the entire time of the recording. Um, and, and you know, he was the, I, I don't know, maybe there was one other person who seemed a little uncomfortable, but I didn't have problems getting the footage. But when I called him and said, you know, let's do the, the deal for the footage, uh, he said, oh, um, I, don't, I don't sign contracts. Now I had a grant that helped me with some of this work and you can't get grant funding without signing something. You just not get it's against like a whole the whole state law. Uh, and so I can't I can't give you money without you signing something. He didn't want to sign anything. So I got, I talked to the university, told them what was going on, and they said we can do it another route. A ask him to do this thing. I can't remember what it was, and then he doesn't have to sign anything. I was like, wow, that's crazy. So I said, well, let's do this other thing. Look, God, you're not going to keep bothering me. You're not going to, you're not going to keep calling me. I, you know, I'll call you back. Never called back. Called him several times after that. He would get so upset when I would call. I'm trying to give this guy money for this work. And he did not want to get, I said, did you, did you do something with the footage? Is there a problem with the footage? He starts yelling. Uh, so yeah, it was an, uh, it was an unfortunate circumstance, <laughs> but, um, I haven't had time to look into legal options, but I just might. And the university well, says I wish they would you, back me up. Yeah, I wish you well with that. I'm sorry to hear that. I have one, one lit, small, not as serious experience with somebody keeping paid for footage. I even paid for it, and they kept it. And mm. uh, it's it's mm. some shady. It's it's it's. 
anyway, but yeah, yeah so I, I felt I empathized. I, I felt the pain yeah. when you when you shit. And I was like, I'm glad you put that in there. Like shame somebody, call them out. I was like, let them know somebody, somebody we has and then you and I like the way you brought them back in. You found a way to bring yeah. some of them back in a little bit. So that that you know, so you know all that good well, listen, work you did there. Yeah. Listen, Dr. Shockley, look, look, we don't have to wait this long before you come back. You're welcome here anytime. Uh, congrats on the new series. The link to it is in the show description. Uh, it's it's always a pleasure. I appreciate you coming through. And uh, again, thank you very much. This has been this has been a lot of fun. It's always yeah, a pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And I always enjoy having some of that debate. You know, a lot of times when people interview you about your film, they don't get into some of that nitty gritty. I appreciate that actually. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. And it does. And it, it is no, you know, again, that I will never stop apologizing outside of that one moment in time. There's never really. Well, I have to tell you, I don't re re recall it very good. much. So. Good. <laughs> no, good. Because it, seriously, I'm glad because it's all, it's, it's, it weighs on me. I feel bad about it. It's, it's one of, it's in my, my highlight reels of, of my or my low light reels that 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 sort of play in the background of my mind, like you know, as a reminder, don't do that again. Don't do that well, again. I'm glad I was a part but you of responded you. with trust me, I've you, had my own. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, we are, but but you responded with a level of graciousness and 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 I mean, you you responded as as a good African would. So I appreciate yeah. it. So. All right. well, look, well, man, anytime you welcome around here, man, take good care, uh, right. you know, and, and, you know, good luck with everything. All right, Thanks again. Too, All right. Peace. Yeah. All right, everybody. Big shout out to Dr. Shockley. Thanks everybody who was here uh, live. Appreciate you coming through those who will see and hear this later. Peace to you as well. Only if you're willing to fight for it, as Fred Hampton used to say, and we will catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the BPM platform. Please make sure you like, share, subscribe, click the bell so you don't miss anything. And yeah, we'll see you tomorrow with EYL and throughout all the other stuff coming up. Again, peace, everybody. Only if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. Catch you next time on I Mix What I, I, I Like, What I, I Like, mix, What I, I Like, mix, What I, I mix, Like, What I, I Like, mix, What I, I Like. Mix, what I like. And what do you sacrifice? Calm. Kindness, kinship. Love. I've given up all chance at inner peace. I made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago for which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my, my eagerness to fight. They set me on a path from which there's no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? Condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. Now the ego that started this fight will never have a mirror or an audience or the light of gratitude. So what do I sacrifice? Everything, 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 everything. everything.